This podcast is sponsored by Tusk, an open source non-ICO crypto project powered by community. Check them out on the web at tusk.network. That's T-U-S-C dot network. The Rob McNeely Program is the nexus of cryptocurrency, blockchain technology, and entrepreneurship. Now, welcome to the program. Today, I am talking to Pascal Hughley. He is a Swiss author, and we're going to talk a little bit about the book that he put out recently called Ignore at Your Own Risk, The New Decentralized World of Bitcoin and Blockchain. So, Pascal, how are you today? Well, I'm good. Uh, thanks, for uh, for being here or for taking me on. It's a great pleasure. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good, despite the virus and the lockdown we have in Switzerland. But yeah, everything's good. So I think your book is actually fairly timely <laughs> right now. Um, so before we jump into kind of what yeah. you wrote about in the book, tell us a little bit about you. What's your background? Well, yeah, I'm a, as I already said, I'm Pascal from Switzerland. I work as a journalist and analyst and also just writer. I do it for a company called Financial Media. That's what I work for. And then I also do some research for another company, which is called Slossberg and Co. It's a, a company where we manage like a portfolio for other people. And uh, yeah, where we especially have a vision for the future and we want to help people protect for what might be coming along our way. And uh, yeah, I mean, I studied economics and politics at University of Zurich. And then quickly uh, at university, when I started my master's, I actually came across Bitcoin, you know, which I really liked. And uh, yeah, I found it a really interesting, like also theoretical uh, endeavor, you know, to dig ever more deeper into and I did this and then I actually dropped off from, from school, you know, because I actually canceled my, my master's because I didn't see any more uh, yeah, real value in doing it. And I just tried to, yeah, spend my time researching on, on Bitcoin and other things. So I got ever more deeper into the topic. And that's why I also then finally in 2019, it was last year when all my friends told me, you, you have to write a book on the topic, you know, it's, 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 you know so much uh, and i mean there's already lots of literature in english but not in german or not that much and that's why i was convinced uh, writing the book and uh, yes so that's why i did it then exactly so what part of uh, switzerland do you live in in zurich well i i mean switzerland is so small so i don't live in the city but i live close to the city i mean it's 20 minutes and then I'm in the center of Zurich, but it's still not Zurich anymore. So that shows you like, kind of like the proportions of how small our country is. Very yeah. nice. Uh, I've, I've been, I've only been to Switzerland once, but I really, really liked it. And uh, back in my past, I worked for a Swiss company for a few years. So um, kind of uh, got an endearing affinity for the Swiss culture. Um, so you wrote a book about Bitcoin. Uh, when you started researching Bitcoin, did you come at it from the standpoint that you thought you were suspicious of it? Or did you come at it from the point of view that you think it's a good thing and you want to invest it in it? Mm -hmm. Well, I thought it was a good thing, but I didn't want to invest, you know, it was like, it was at university, maybe because I studied economics, you know, I was really hit by all the, the mainstream economic theory, you know, Keynesianism, neoclassicalism, you know, and I found this very interesting, but I still always thought that can't be the end of the line, you know, there must be more. So uh, back in university, I started researching the whole Austrian economic thing, you know, I might be familiar with that, you know, uh, because I also lived in Vienna for quite uh, some time and uh, there, then I like met like some other people who really are still standing in the tradition of all these, you know, real Austrians, Ludwig von Mises, Hayek and like many more that actually lived in Vienna and around uh, Austria as well. So then I kind of familiarized myself with these topics, you know, found it very interesting because I never heard about that uh, university. I also went up to my teacher one time and asked him, do you know who Ludwig von Mises is? And he didn't. So I was kind of like 
okay, if he doesn't know, there must be something to it, you know? So I started looking into it. So I already came from this very uh, theoretical background studying Austrian economics because I just found it to be a more realistic way of approaching economics, you know, to see it as a social science, not that much of a, of a science where you can get yourself a good job and earn a lot of money. It was literally like trying to understand the real world, you know, and also the epistemological questions, philosophical questions that these guys really touch on. So I really liked it. And there I kind of then bumped into Bitcoin. So for me, it was theoretical and really interesting, uh, like uh, then, or it was really interesting going down this route but still it was more theoretical. I was like, wow, there's something happening in the real world. And it really it didn't really came, or didn't really come to my mind to start investing. You know, I only did this uh, like two years later. So I, I got to know Bitcoin back in 2014 and then only invested like after two years of more research, maybe in 2016. So yeah, but it was still okay. Yeah. And well, I was a student. Okay. I didn't have any money anyways, you know, so. What about now? Yeah, I still like, uh, I mean, yeah, still interested. And, uh, but I mean, I, I'm not one of these really crypto billionaires. I have some friends in Switzerland because actually uh, you might have heard of it, the Crypto Valley. It's a space uh, where we kind of, we framed it. It's around Zug and Zurich, you know. Uh, like in, in in opposition to Silicon Valley, if you will, and uh, that's it's, it's it's world known actually for for being the crypto valley, and there we have like uh, lots of friends, even which are younger or, or that are my age, that actually are really well off now because they just had some money invested even earlier, and I'm around these people, so it's kind of cool. But still, I myself, I always. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have it with Ludwig von Mises, who actually one time said, or like his wife, he, his wife confronted him and was like, well, you study money so closely, but you probably won't ever have that much money. And it's probably the same with me. You know, I'm, I'm just too interested in all the theoretical stuff. I forget everything around me and then I don't even invest. <laughs> but uh, yeah, sure. Well, in your book, you talked a little bit about how we left the Industrial Revolution but yet our money is still kind of in the industrial revolution. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, when I uh, started like writing the book uh, or even like really like um, trying to understand Bitcoin, I, I saw that it's all about money as well. You know, as with Austrian economics, man, much is about money. And, and, and at the university, I, I never really studied money because it's a, uh, to me money as well is a social phenomenon so it doesn't really have to do anything or like also like normal like mainstream economic economists they don't really look at that you know because they say everything needs to be in equilibrium and uh we're so many of the times we're not there but the economy or like economy strives towards the equilibrium so something that's really a phenomenon that's that is emergent and that might be out of it equilibrium is not something worth to be studied so that's why at university you never really studied it you know and with bitcoin i found it really interesting that it, it's not only before if you want to understand it if you want to understand what's money is you have to go into psycho psychology you know you have to go into history you have to go in all these other uh, go all, go down all these other routes you know and that's what i did and then especially history was something very interesting for me you know where i actually found well you can maybe say that you're, you that's what, what my view is you can try to say that our world is kind of can be divided up into these eras you know and then i kind of found that there might be an era called the industrial revolution you know or, or industrial era that started back in the 19th century going out of holland and then especially britain you know where it ever grew ever bigger and that's where also like the society as we know it today maybe started to scale up, you know, because we had all these big banks, you know, that started to finance industry and then uh, like railways came along and all these things. And finally also then European people went over to the United States and built up the same big empire over there, you know. 
but there we are really was the beginning of bigger institutions of corporations um, you know of the joint stock corporation as you can might be able to call it and all these institutions we have now also the state maybe then started to really grow and take off ever more responsibilities so with all these institutions um i would argue we are still in this age you know and that's what i figured out with the book and that's what i tried to write but now with with the internet that's been emerging in the last uh, 20 to 30 years there's been a new force that's coming up you know that can be kind of or can be seen in, in in somehow in 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 line with this whole thing because like normal economies the state and, and like corporations they also use the internet but there's a whole new world that seems to be in kind of in juxtaposition to that you know and bitcoin is a new iteration of that you know that's also pushing in another direction if you will you know and that's what i found really interesting that we might see new institutions enabled through the internet emerge that could be really saw institutions that challenge our, our older institutions that I would call the industrial age institutions. And as I said, the internet and Bitcoin and maybe blockchain as a institutional technology could really do a lot of uh, in the future, you know, when it comes uh, to changing how our society works. And that's what I kind of try to expand in the book as well. I don't so know how do that? So how do you envision the the future look as far as money goes? What is the future of money? Yeah, the future of money. Well, I would say, I mean, there's so much because again, as I said, money is a social phenomenon. So there's more, probably not this one money will be like the, the thing dominating in the future, you know, but also due to this industrial age or we could call it, you know, we had the paper money emerge, you know, national state currencies emerge and, and and they used to be tied to gold you know as we know because uh otherwise uh, states probably couldn't have really like bootstrapped these state national currencies you know but as we also know 1971 like the gold window was closed like uh, permanently and uh yeah i mean um we have these monies they are still really prevalent today but I think with Bitcoin, I mean, we really see that there's been a new competitor out on the field, you know, and that's what I find, find really interesting, you know, because uh, when, when gold was detached from, from the state currencies, you actually had like gold competing against national currencies, but gold is money, might not be a really good medium of exchange, but it's still economic, economically speaking money. So we always had like, gold uh, competing against national currents. We always saw it when like crises were happening or when people di didn't really trust their government anymore. People, they would buy up money like gold and silver, you know, and now with Bitcoin, you have a new kid on the block, if you will, you know, that could be a potential competitor. And then also maybe crypto assets in general, you know, that might be spawned out of, of this whole new phenomenon that, Bitcoin actually ushered in. So we don't really know where we're going there, you know, but in my book, I, I especially concentrated on Bitcoin, you know, because it's just the first uh, thing that's here and that mo at the moment is also the most prevalent one, you know, but then I think you have this competition, you know, in the future. And uh, I think Bitcoin will gain ever more in popularity also because of things that we're in maybe right now, even though, when you look at the price in the last uh, two weeks, Bitcoin also went down. So all the people came along and said, Bitcoin is no safe haven and you can forget about it again. But I mean, I don't have this really like short time frame. I look into the future and I say, well, this whole crisis that might be upon us now, you know, could also bring like markets down. You, we talked about it before, you know, it could bring supply chains down and all these things. So it will bring the system down and, and people might then go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And I'm really excited for, and also curious how many people will be pushed because of that towards Bitcoin. And then they will also go down the rabbit hole. It might not be that many people after all, because the system maybe is gonna, uh, you know, somehow stabilize itself again. But I think many, or like a couple of people will try to, contemplate things and, and and then maybe adopt bitcoin for themselves you know and the more people will do it the more uh, interesting it will become because bitcoin i see is really a competitor to national state currencies 
not only when it comes to medium of exchange and all these things that we're still not really in the know how, where Bitcoin will actually take us, but also when it comes to sort of value and just of money that's unconfiscatable, you know, that you yourself can own, that you can, as a crypto asset with Bitcoin, you can, what I call in the book also, you can do crypto secession, you, you, you can crypto secede, you know, with your money. So I find this a very interesting idea, actually. Do you think that cryptocurrencies will actually undermine the sovereignties of governments in the future? Yeah, that's also a very interesting question. I mean, when you look at the whole history and, and how it was designed, it's probably, it was designed as an alternative to our today system, you know? And it was designed the way that you can really get a hold of it and you control it yourself. You know, you don't have to put it into an institution again where the institution has the keys and, and you don't really own the thing. You know, with Bitcoin, as we always hear, you can be your own bank. You can be your own bank CEO, if you will, because you are in, in control of the keys and nobody can take it from you, even all, all, except like, unless it holds a gun to your head and then he can always force you, you know, but uh, I mean, and states can obviously do this because they have the force, the monopoly on force. So there, I don't really know how things are actually really going on uh, develop, you know, I would expect that uh, with Bitcoin gaining in traction, you know, with the money, like the, the old industrial money system showing ever more cracks, you know, and we're seeing some of it happening right now again with the Corona thing, you know, that it might be Corona is, is, is a really bad thing, but it might so also be the thing that really pops the, the, the bubble, you know, which was like uh, built up way before Corona because the system itself was just really brittle because of like institutionalized money creation, you know, banks that can uh, create, uh, money out of thin air, central banks that have bloated their like balance sheets and everything always to also like fight the last recession we had in 2008. And it wasn't really a, like a, a lasting sustainable fight against the recession. It was just papering over old, old cracks, you know, with, with new money. And that's not the goal, you know? So there, I think the more our old system will show all these cracks, you know, and will really let people down and fail people. These people then will, will, will probably move towards something else. And I'm not really sure how many people that, that will be, you know? Will it be a critical mass that it can actually really challenge the money monopoly of the state in, in its whole? Or will it always be a little fringe movement that just takes their own individual sovereignty, which is already something very cool because nowadays, if you run a full node, if you have your own Bitcoin, you can be your individual sovereign, you know? But as a whole, because only a couple of people do this, it might not really challenge the state after all. And I don't really know which route we're actually going down. You know, I see that more individuality is happening. I have friends that come up to me, but oftentimes it's just because they want to make money with Bitcoin, you know, and they're into sell it afterwards again for dollars, for Swiss francs, for state national currencies. So you see, they're not really here to challenge the system, you know? So, and I, I mean, Bitcoin as a tool is only as good as we people really use it. You know, if we just use it as a tool to make more national currencies in the end, we're not really challenging it. But I mean, yeah, there is a possibility that people could really long-term stay with Bitcoin and stick with Bitcoin because the, the old system is just letting them down, you know? Also speaking of uh, potential pensions crisis in, in Europe, you know, like, uh, like the population that's aging ever more and, and all these cracks that the state is kind of try, is kind of trying to fight now. And I don't know how long he can still put up a good fight and maybe he can't. And that's what I'm also trying to explore in the book, you know, but I'm really, I don't have a definite answer. Probably nobody has, but yeah. Uh, we'll see how it's all going to unravel. And as it unravels, which uh, I think you talk a little bit about in your book, is what happens or how is the state going to react when it feels threatened by cryptocurrencies? Mm. Yeah, I mean, we've already seen states react against it. Maybe now not so host hostile yet, you know, because they think it's still this fringe phenomenon that you don't have to, you don't have to take care of. Um, well, I think probably 
that will be going on like this, uh, like on a global scale, uh, a little longer until maybe crypto is really a force to be reckoned with, and then they will probably try to crack down even harder. But but by by, by this time, it might already be too late. So uh, from a crypto perspective or a Bitcoin perspective, you would have to hope that it would be too late, you know. But then at the same time, so I can imagine many people, you also see it in, in states that are called failed governments, you know, Ecuador, Venezuela, all these countries. There, you can already see that, I mean, they're cracking down on things. Sometimes uh, even they don't do it, you know, because Venezuela, I was told by a friend, even the government tried to like um, use, use cryptocurrencies, you know, start mining cryptocurrencies because they found it to be something interesting they can profit themselves from. Also, when you think that other countries like the US and bigger countries, you know, are, are trying to sanction states like North Korea and other Ruth states, you know, and they could have an interest in adopting even though they are themselves challenged by crypto, you know, so you have these really paradoxical situations, you know, where you also, I can't imagine that like a world government could come along and, and shut it down, you know, because we don't have a world government and I don't think in our geopolitical situation today, all the states would magically gather up together and uh, would unified uh, or have a unified or would be a unified force to, to shut crypto down, you know, and as long as you don't have that, I mean, Bitcoin and all these crypto assets, they are decentralized, they can be spawned up somebody somewhere else in the country when they are shut down at some place, you know, it's really hard to kill him, you know. Uh, I, I got uh, I got an example last time uh, told where people like they compared Bitcoin and all these currencies to starfish, you know. And I didn't know that when you cut off a starfish uh, leg, you know, like a new one immediately like grows again. And I think it's really good analogy to say that's exactly how these crypto things work, you know. So. I think states will react like hostile and, and uh, some will do it, some uh, will try it, some will see it as a benefit. Also maybe like so far the state of Switzerland, you know, where I think like the regulators, they're really open. You can also talk to them. We do it on a regular basis, you know, that they, and they seem to be very open. So um, there's not going to be a, like a unified force against these cryptos, at least uh, so far, I wouldn't tell. And I don't think they can pull it off because they can't even combat climate change, if you will. So they won't be able to combat crypto as well. So, yeah. So um, how do you see crypto as empowering individuals? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as I already said, I, I find it a very interesting thing, you know, that, I mean, there are so many ways it can empower you, you know, you can, like, I have a practical example from my book, you know, uh, we had a, a, a person that was proofreading our English book, you know, and I also had a designer that was before the book as well, who did some covers for me, you know, out of Pakistan. So then I sent money to him, you know, uh, I tried to send dollars to the guy in Pakistan and it didn't work, you know, uh, it just didn't get there, you know. So then I chose, uh, I was like, okay, Pakistan, it's a country, uh, I can imagine that things don't work because the, my Swiss banks, or well, my Swiss bank actually don't, might not be uh, liking to touch uh, Pakistani things. So I, I, I was kind of okay. And then I sent Bitcoin and that all worked, you know, but I mean, then I also p wanted to pay our, our uh, proofreader out of Canada. And I mean, Canada is a Western nation as well. You know, I, I would compare it to Switzerland. I don't want to, I wouldn't call it the shady state or something, you know, and even there we tried to use like the normal banking system and it didn't work. We paid it. And afterwards, money came back and it came, less came back, you know, like $50 was just gone, you know, for something that didn't work. So the customer experience was really bad. So we also opted for Bitcoin. And there I saw, that's really cool, you know, that then with Bitcoin, it all worked. It empowered me, it empowered the, the proofreader we had, you know. Uh, that's just a practical example of, of using it as a, as a, like a means of payment and stuff, you know. But then I also find it really interesting to have a non-sovereign store of value 
that I myself can own, you know, on my little hard drive, a hard wallet, and nobody can take it from me, you know, especially now with uh, stock markets going down, you know, in the last few days, you heard like stock markets closing or just being um, terminated for a couple of minutes, you know, you never know, maybe they're going to close stock markets down permanently or like for more than a few days, you know, and also with banks, maybe we already saw it in, in Greece and in, in Cyprus, you know, where they actually rationed the money and you couldn't take money uh, off your bank you know and there you might be in a really tricky situation and again you have crypto it empowers you you might be able to still have it whether you can use it to buy like bread at your at your baker i don't know yet if he's aware of bitcoin and if he would even take it but still like psychologically it just really helps me to know i have something on my key drive I even have it maybe memorized, you know, the, the seed phrase, the words, I have memorized it in my, in my head and nobody else knows that I have that money, you know, or that I have that crypto. And that's something I really like personally because I think uh, financial privacy is still something which is very important. And when I talked to, I got last week, we had a course when I talked to, a person who deals with regulation, financial regulation, AML, know your customer and all these things. And the things she told me, it just clearly showed me like financial privacy is dead. You know, it's, it's, it's completely dead. Um, and uh, going into the future, it will be, it, it won't get better, I think. And there I find it really important that at least we have something like Bitcoin um, and other cryptos which are maybe even more private you know but that you yourself can own and that you yourself maybe can see for yourself that you have some financial privacy left so that's maybe a couple of ways i see it empowering the individual you know so in all your research about bitcoin have you drawn any conclusions on why bitcoin has not been adopted yet well uh yeah i mean uh, for one thing, I would argue maybe, and it comes back to the point before, maybe because I'm not so sure whether Bitcoin will, well, whether there will be really this hyper Bitcoinization and, and it will really, really uh, challenge the state in a, in a significant way. Maybe Bitcoin wasn't really made for mass adoption, you know, maybe it was always made for a couple of people who really, uh, who have problem with the government, who maybe have problem that everyone is trying to spy on them, who are maybe uh, some special type of people, you know, maybe these so-called libertarians, you know, I myself have like uh, a great uh, sympathy for this way of thinking. So maybe it was made for these kind of people, you know, and this is why at the moment our world, I mean, when I talk to my mom and to my friends, especially here in Switzerland also, everything runs smoothly, you know, and, and, and they don't need that, you know, because they say, yeah, the state might be taxing me and, uh, and things might become more expensive, but still I can go on vacation. I have enough money. All is good. You know, what you, are you complaining about, you know, and I might be uh, from their perspective a little bit too, too, uh, yeah, thinking about things that are not so imminent, you know, paranoid, uh, one could call it. But still, at the same time, I also try to explain these people, you know, um, you might be one day, you might be happy and, and really lucky that you have something like Bitcoin, you know, we never know. I just have to stay humble because I don't know what's going to be here in 10 years time, you know, maybe the world has completely changed. Maybe we're leaving the industrial age and we're leaving into a whole new age of techno panopticum where we all are controlled we we don't know maybe we we move into a state where we don't need crypto either you know because it's still a free and open world i just don't know and i would say i have to own it out of humility but many people don't see that argument yet you know and also it doesn't really yeah it doesn't resonate with these people you know because they don't uh yeah, they have their job, all is fine, and uh, they don't need it. But maybe again, you know, we had it back in 2018 when, when we saw this crisis or this financial repression, you know, um, with the problem that emerged out of the US. I mean, there many people suddenly started asking questions, you know, and they, many of my friends then back then 
also discovered Austrian economics, you know, back then Bitcoin wasn't there yet. So they discovered the theoretical thing. They were asking a couple of questions. Some of them read a, a book, but then two, two to three years later, everything was fine again. And nobody knew again, oh, back then I read a book by Mises, but now who is he? So there you also saw kind of people actually got, uh, they have had a lot of questions when things were, were imminent. But then when things all were, were good again, they didn't ask the questions anymore. And that's also something maybe with, with, with a new crisis happening, with, with states really letting them down because the pension systems doesn't really uh, work anymore. Also with millennials who are asking themselves the question, will I be able to buy myself a good house over here? Because in Switzerland, especially housing prices are huge, you know, maybe in other cities in the US, it's the same, you know, but in Switzerland, uh, like really, especially, I mean, and, and many of the, the millennials seeing Bitcoin also as a revenge, you know, against the boomers. And that's maybe why they will stick to Bitcoin. So it's just going to be these, um, you know, these fates, these, these individual fates that will determine whether Bitcoin will be adopted more and more. And I, when I look forward, I see some more potential that Bitcoin will be more adopted. But right now, so far, there weren't really these, um, these reasons, you know, and that's maybe why it wasn't really mass adopted yet, you know. I think it makes sense. Pascal. Where can people find out more about you and where can people get your book? Well, the book itself is uh, available on, on Amazon. Yeah, you can find it through Amazon. You can get it there. Yeah, it's all about, as I already said, money. Also, we talk about Ethereum, you know, the whole smart contract thing, you know, that might be interesting that I myself are also a little skeptical on, but it was, I thought it, it's worth exploring and really see where we might be going with this, maybe even in a, in a, in a, in a, in a more long-term view. And then, yeah, I mean, you can find me on Twitter, you know, um, my Twitter handle is P A H. U E G Pahuk, and that's where I will be at. And I love to talk to people. So yeah, sure, hit me up would be great. Thank you so much, Pascal. I appreciate you coming on the show today, folks. I will have all his information linked up at robmcneely.com. Uh, and make sure you take care of yourself out there. Thank you. Thank you, man. Bye, you too. Bye, guys. Thank you for listening to the Rob McNeely program. Make sure you check us out on the web at robmcneely.com and subscribe to our podcast at YouTube, iTunes, and on the Google Play Store.